Good morning on this Thursday morning. It's a little bit of sunshine, at least in my part of the area. So give thanks to God for some sunshine. It's good to see. So let's gather this morning once again in prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Praise the blessed and holy Trinity, one God who gives us life, salvation, and resurrection. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship and praise. Be still and know that I am We continue with Grateful by um, Diana Butler Bass. Yesterday we started the part about just the, um, our full stories, the, the parts of our life. And some of us have larger portions or more egregious portions of trauma and suffering, um, pain, reality of that in our lives and others. We all have some. At different levels, uh, pray to God, not to the level um, that she's mentioning here, but also know that our whole story is our story, and some of it doesn't doesn't have to define us, but it does inform our um, form a lot of our life. And so the this, the quote from now and at the end of of the presence of God and and the gratitude for the good things that happen in our lives is easy to be grateful for all of our lives, the good as well as the bad, the moments of joy as well as the moments of sorrow, successes as well as the failures, the rewards as well as the rejections requires hard spiritual work. Let's underline that hard spiritual work. It's hard work. So that as some of the work she, she brings in at the end of this part of this chapter, a... Um, a metaphor of gardening and it's a, it's a good timing for us because Mother's Day is around the corner here in about two weeks so we'll be thinking about some planting as those starters are for sale and we kind of plan our garden for the year so let's see what she says about gardening. Along the way a friend a person who herself had known suffering said to me your life is like a garden and it is not and it is not well tended you need to grow your garden until then, I had never really thought of the emotional life as a garden, an organic metaphor, but that is much closer to reality. Our emotional lives are like gardens. Experiences are akin to soil, the rich tenor um, in which our feelings grow. Left unattended, certain emotions can choke out others, like the wild grasses that threaten my lettuces every year. There is nothing inherently wrong with weeds. It is just that they get in the way of our dinner. So I pay attention. I know the difference between the seedlings I plant and the invasive ones, cultivating the greens and pulling out what would make my family sick. So it is with our emotional lives. The same soil allows both weeds and desirable plants to grow. And it takes a watchful gardener and more than a little practice to ensure the health and productivity of the whole. I learned to work the garden and discovered that it was a spiritual work of gratitude. In a very real way, suffering is just the soil. From, from it grow both negative and positive emotions. The negative ones are like weeds in the high summer, the positive ones, including gratitude, too often the small, smallest of shoots. Over the years, I have discovered that hard work on one's knees is the surest way to tend the garden, both in prayer and in rooting around in the dirt of the soul. I recognize the difference between what is fruitful and what will inhibit the growth of goodness and then pluck out the invasive species. But if the work is done, 
the garden flourishes and there gratitude grows. I cannot remember a single moment when I was able to forgive. It did not work like that. Instead, I went on tending the garden, growing what could be grown and rooting out the weeds. Then one morning, some 40 years after the fact, I woke up feeling sorry for my uncle. I thought about how he had gone to prison, how my aunt divorced him for emotional cruelty. I remembered how the pastor who buried him begged my mother to pay for a grave marker. She refused. I wondered what had wounded him so, why he had made the choices he made, and perhaps who had hurt him that he hurt others. What happened long before he was born? Had he been a victim too? I felt something, pity, empathy, I don't know. But I saw him as a deeply flawed human being, not a monster, a human who had wasted his life, who had squandered the only real gift he had, lived bereft of hope and love, and lies in an unmarked grave. And I felt oddly grateful, not for his suffering or for the injustice done to me. No one should ever feel grateful for sin, evil, or violence. No one should ever express gratitude for the bad choices of others. Those bad choices are never gifts. I do not know what if, no, if what I felt was forgiveness, but I experienced a pr profound sense of appreciation that my own pain had not taken the same form as his hand had. This suddenly seemed a miracle, as was my awareness that my life has been, for the most part, rewarding. A good family, strong faith, meaningful work, all the things that had eluded him. Somehow I had found courage and conviction to make it through and in midlife could say thank you to those around me, to the universe and to God. Gratitude has grown in that soil, good soil. It is not the dirt of shame. All the shit had only enriched the dirt. Somewhere in the earth, a thanksgiving had taken root. From the ground had sprung life. Through seedling, seeding and weeding, the vine had come forth and its fruit had ripened. For that, my heart was grateful. As emotion, gratitude can be elusive, so easily blocked by regret, anger, loss, and fear. So I tried to keep a daily record of gratitude. When I did, however, I realized something important. I was filling a little yellow diary with things, a pleasant meal with a family, a surprise compliment, a new book contract, a car repair, my daughter's grades at college, my gratitude diary became a kind of list of the benefits of being a middle-class white person. It actually made me uncomfortable. I realized that I thought of gratitude as a common commodity tally, a sort of positive emotional account for nice stuff. To pay attention to good things was a helpful practice as it displaced negative attitudes related to entitlement and privilege, things that often blocked my ability to see my own life clearly. However, the diary missed what was revealed in my long struggle with abuse and what was most important. Gratitude at its deepest and perhaps most transformative level is not warm feelings about what we have. Instead, gratitude is a deep ability to embrace the gift of who we are, that we are. That is the anti-billion year history. That is a multi-billion year history, excuse me, of the universe each one of us has been born can love, grows in awareness, and has a story. Life is a gift. When that mystery fills our hearts, it overwhelms us with a deep river of emotions flows, emotions flowing forth, Free, feelings we barely knew we were capable of holding. At that moment, we feel stunned. We might thank God, we might thank our ancestors and the random choices they made that created a line that led to us, mom and dad, the big bang, evolution, whatever but we might feel, also feel the transcendent awe of life that in the entirety of the cosmos, through the enormity of time, I am, you are, and we are. What we feel when we contemplate that, that feeling is gratitude. Life is the first gift, said poet Marge Piercy. Love is the second, understanding the third. The first gift is life, my life, your life. There exists a unique beauty and dignity at the core of each of us, the quality that animates every human being, the Jews and Christians called the image of God. That is a gift. No other gifts is possible without it. Nothing can be 
we can ever receive and have can rival it. Gratitude is not about stuff. Gratitude is the emotional response to the surprise of our very existence, to sensing that inner light and realizing the astonished sacred social and scientific events that brought each one of us into being. We cry out like the psalmist, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139, 14. When we push aside the immediate anxieties of that existence, we can actually see more clearly that to feel doubt, fear, or anger at all is part of the gift of life itself. Without life, even the negative emotions are impossible. Everything else is dependent on that one thing. All we experience is radically contingent on a single gift, life. If you have understood this as thoroughly as Ellie Weisel, Holocaust survival novelist, and here in an interview with Oprah, herself an abuse survivor. So here's a little exchange, Oprah. There may be no person, no better person than you to talk about living with gratitude. Despite all the tragedy we've, you have witnessed, do you still have a place inside you for gratefulness? Ellie, absolutely. Right after the war, I went around telling people, thank you for just living, for being human. And to this day, the words that come most frequently to my lips are thank you. When a person doesn't feel gratitude, something is missing in his or her humanity. A person cannot, can almost be, be defined by his or her gra attitude toward gratitude. Oprah, does having seen the worst of humanity make you more grateful for ordinary occurrences? Ellie, for me, every hour is grace. And I feel gratitude in my heart each time I can meet someone and look at his or her smile. This insight stands out. When people lack gratitude, something is missing in their humanity. People can almost be defined by their attitude toward gratitude. Weisel is not speaking of appreciating material goods. He means that our ability to experience life as a gift, to treasure that, to treasure that gift, to feel its power, even in the most violent and demeaning of circumstances, is the very essence of human existence. Life is a gift, not what we have, but what we are. To feel gratitude is not the caboose of some faith train. It's the beginning. To feel appreci appreciative awareness of our own lives, to feel that awareness of the lives of all those around us is rather like being reborn. As we look at ourselves, our experiences in the world with the eyes of surprise and wonder, pay attention to those who have suffered and who have found gratefulness. Listen to the voices of so the songs, the marginalized, the thanksgiving of those who have been abused and oppressed. Embrace the sorrows of your own heart. Those are the teachers of gratitude. Do not be afraid. Is there a word that captures the characteristics of the grateful person? Asked psychologist Philip Watkins in the midst of data points and research citations in his academic tech textbook, a startling statement appears. I believe there's a word that helps answer the question he opened. For me, that word is grace. Grateful people are full of grace. Grateful people feel life to be a gift. Every hour is grace, said Ellie Weisel. Yes, an amazing grace and a gift. Part of me doesn't want to say anything more, but I will anyway, because, you know, <laughs> that's the point. Um, with the gardening metaphor, one thing that came to mind is um, the work of tilling the soil and, and how um, the work's important, our piece of that of tilling and preparing and fertilizing and everything. But some of that is out of our control too. Um, and the timing of it, the, um, the when the rain's gonna come, when the sun's gonna come, if too much wind it comes. Um, there's life in that too, of course, as she's, as she's pulling forth as a salient point in this part, life is gonna happen even as you tend the garden. There'll be steps back and steps forward. There'll be times when you're just stuck, when it feels like things will not grow. But I, I listened to a, a podcast this morning about daily bread. And it talked about this planting season and how we put a dead seed in the ground and then we wait. <laughs> um, and then new life comes. And when you think of death, Christ's death and resurrection, some, out of something dead came new life. Out of the death in our lives comes resurrection comes new hope comes um, abundance and it takes work even the parts those parts that are completely out of our control and then there's parts that we we are called the tent so and another thought with the metaphor here um i might i may have shared this story with you before but in my in minnesota i had quite the beautiful um, butterfly and bee garden that we had put in um 
but in some of it, it had I inherited, and some of it was um, stuff that we had put. So kind of in that transitional, like, is this something I planted, or is this something the previous owner planted? Um, I was tending to this this kind of interesting plant along my my fence line, um, and it had unique leaves, and it was growing, and it had um, it looked like it was going to have a purple flower of some sort. And I tended it, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and pretty soon it was as tall as the the, the um, but I'm like it, you know, it looks like it's it's not too it's too flimsy, it's it's too solid to be a weed. It's got to be something that is supposed to be here. Well, I mean, you know, did the, there's apps these days that you can take a picture and figure out what it was. I was attending a lovely plant of ragweed, um, and every. <laughs> getting rid of that thing at, after we figured it out why I was having such allergic reactions and why I was miserable after being in the garden. Um, hmm. Maybe it was because I was cultivating a noxious weed that I was allergic to. So as we tend our garden, our emotional garden, we need help sometimes to, to recognize the difference between the weeds and those smallest of shoots that are gratitude and new life beginning in us. Um, because sometimes we end up tending the wrong thing. The, the beauty of that is we can realize it and we can adjust. Granted, for the next like two years and probably still the new owners are dealing with that, um, two, three years, I had to deal with the repercussions of cultivating a weed, which made all of its friends come too. Sometimes that happens in life, doesn't it? We, we attend the wrong thing and then have it multiply. But God is good. And even though I attended the wrong thing, there was an abundance in other parts of the garden too, which is pretty phenomenal. I love this image of life as a gift, that mantra, that, that refrain, life is a gift, life is a gift, life is a gift. Be still and know that I am God. You have been born anew through the living and abiding word of God. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Mighty God of mercy, we thank you for the resurrection dawn bring in the glory of our risen Lord who makes every day new. Especially we thank you for the sustaining goodness of your creation. We thank you for garden plots for us to tend, whether they be actually gardens or some other part of our lives that we can cultivate, we can care for, we can prune, we can care for. We thank you that um, you are the vine and we are the branches that our life force, our life, our redemption comes from you. And that you are the vine dresser pruning us of what needs to be taken from us so that we can bear fruit and have life. It's so hard to know what to prune, Lord. We're thankful that you know what needs to be taken and that you take it and allow flourishing in our gifted lives. For the new creation in Christ and all gifts of healing and forgiveness, we pray. We pray for those in our community in need of your care this day. We pray for those who are having challenges with their, with their parents, with those who are having challenges with their children, those who are, have cancer, those who are waiting for those COVID tests to come in our world that needs help. We pray for all the needs that are out there that need your pruning shears, but also need that care of soil, that comfortable place to bring forth life, the provision that you provide in that new life it brings. Continue to be with all in need of healing and forgiveness. For the gifts of relationship with others, we rejoice and we ask for your help. We lift up especially today relationships with coworkers, um, that they 
in these challenging times of having to figure out how to be at work with each other um, or in distance yet at work with each other, um, that you're that you create trust and community rather than tear it down. Care for those relationships that are part of our lives for eight hours plus a day sometimes and, and can impact the rest of life. May workplaces be safe places for all. We also ask for um, our relationships with those who have differing opinions than us, sometimes very important entrenched opinions. Bless, keep, sustain, bring joy to the places that is needed this day. For the communion of faith in your church, we thank you and we ask you to continue to create community among us. Merciful God of might, renew this weary world, heal the hurts of all your children, and bring about your peace for all in Christ Jesus, the living Lord. Especially we pray for those who govern nations of the world. We pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris. We pray for our Congress. We pray for our judicial branch. We pray for our United States of America. We pray for other countries in the world and our interconnectedness with one another and for the weariness that they're facing as well. We pray for our local government here in Washington. We pray for our counties and all these phases that we're in moving back and forth. We pray for our weariness and we pray for the life that you have promised. For the people in countries ravaged by strife or warfare, pandemics, all the things, Lord, we pray. We pray especially for India today and the fear that that instills in us. We ask you to reflect with us when we are grateful that we're not there. What does that mean, Lord, as we talk about gratitude? The gratitude, what is it when we're thankful that we're not suffering what something else, somebody else is suffering? Make us uncomfortable, Lord. I know we're very uncomfortable these days, Lord, but make us uncomfortable and rather than complacent and to maintain safety and wise decisions, but also to be aware and to be moved in all the senses of that word, because there are people who are suffering and are in need. And some of them are right across the street or in our same homes. For all who work for peace and international harmony, we give thanks. For all who strive to save the earth from carelessness and destruction, we ask for your provision. And for the church of Jesus Christ in every land, Lord, in this season of Easter, we give thanks for the resurrection, for life out of death, for your continued grace and forgiveness that comes. Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin or over, be overcome in adversity. And all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless and preserve us this day. Amen. You notice we bless God there and then we get blessed by God. Pretty cool stuff.